Thanks, Christina. Um, so as Christina mentioned, my name is Brendan. Uh, I work at Google, uh, and I'm going to be talking about candidate testing strategies. I'd also like to introduce um, two fellow panelists, uh, David and Daniel. Uh, they work with me at Google on KUnit, and uh, they will be assisting me with answering some of your questions. With that, I'll get started. So um, uh, first off, uh, as, the, as the name implies, KUnit is uh, a unit testing framework, and I, I'm going to touch on that a little bit more. But this talk came out of, uh, I was hoping to talk about um, how to write tests in a number of different situations, and there were a lot of different areas that I really originally wanted to cover, some of which including uh, hardware testing and otherwise just testing code with a lot of uh, difficult to handle dependencies. Um, I realized as I put this talk together that if I tried to cut, if I wanted to cover everything uh, that I originally wanted to, this talk would probably be several hours long. Um, so this talk, I'm just going to fo focus on the uh, basics, on the best practices for writing. Uh, basic uh, tests, uh, the, the establishing the, uh, the necessary context for that. And if we have some time at the end, depending on how, how many questions we get, I can, I'm going to cover some of those other topics, um, give just sort of a brief overview, and we'll either uh, cover those other topics in either additional uh, Linux Foundation events, or we'll maybe post some follow-up videos afterwards. Um, so I mentioned unit testing. I was going to explain what that is. So uh, we've, we've talked, I've talked about this topic has been a topic of major of, of discussion on the mailing list for a while. And uh, I, I don't think it's super important for the purpose of this talk to outline exactly what a unit test and integration test or a functional test, uh, sometimes called an end-to-end -end test, actually is. Um, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to say that an end-to-end -end test or a functional test is a test um, that runs in user space and uh, tests the kernel via accessing uh, syscalls or uh, special files like device files and proc files and such. Uh, those tests are very important. I'm in no way saying that those tests are not important. I actually think that they that any any new device file, or especially any, any syscall call, should absolutely be accompanied by those kinds of tests. Um, however, uh, KUnit focuses on the uh, in-kernel tests, uh, where you test uh, kernel APIs, things like uh, data structures inside the Linux kernel, like the linked list, uh, things like that should actually say print K, not print F. Um, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So again, the other kinds of the tests are important too, but today we're going to be talking about in-kernel tests. So if at any point I misspeak and say unit tests, just think in-kernel test. Um, so why, why, are, why are testing internal APIs important? Um, I think that there's, there's, kind of, there's two questions that you can ask yourself to decide whether testing an internal API is important or not. Uh, the one is, do people use your APIs? If, if, people, if other people do use your APIs, then it would probably be really important to them to know if your APIs change, in which case you should probably like, test them. And if not, that means there's probably not a lot of people who understand how they work, in which case you should probably write tests to make it easier for other people if they ever do need to go in and change your APIs, um, that it's easier for them to do so, or if you're you become unable to maintain your code at some point, uh, or there's just too much work that it's easier for other people to deal with it. Um, the other the other question you can ask yourself is, uh, do your APIs change a lot? Uh, if the answer is yes, then testing helps people understand how the APIs are changing, because testing helps document behavior. Uh, if your APIs don't change a lot, then you should also still probably test them, because uh, people are going to be that much more surprised if they do change, um, and tests will help reflect that. So a common notion is that tests provide stability, and that's true. But tests are also provide other 
uh, functionality, tests or documentation. Um, when I look at a code base that's well tested, um, I, I've in the past worked on a lot of code bases outside of Linux kernel. And I'll often look when I'm trying to understand how a uh, API works, I'll look at the tests for that API because they often show all of the different edge cases and they usually have minimal examples of how it works. Plus, I know that if people are act or people are regularly running tests, those tests are always going to be up to date. Um, in other words, documentation gets stale, tests don't. Of course, you should keep your documentation up to date as best you can, but uh, there isn't really anything to validate that that is actually the case. Um, as I mentioned before, tests also show how code behaves. Um, and another, another thing which is particularly important for internal, uh, for in-kernel testing, um, if you, if you sit down and think about how you would go about trying to make sure that something as big as the kernel was well tested by only using user space APIs, I think you'd quickly realize that there are an insane amount of different possible states that the kernel can be in. And your test would have to, your test would have to try to manipulate the kernel to get into every single possible state. Um, however, if you test lower down functions, the amount of state within that call stack is much smaller. Um, and the amount of state, a potential state goes up combinatorially with the number of functions in that call stack. So the only way to achieve high levels of coverage realistically is to, uh, to test internal APIs. All right. So now I'm going to go over a brief how to use KUnit. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Um, at the end, uh, please, actually during this, eh, I, I'll wait till the end. At the end, uh, please ask me questions if you if there's anything that doesn't make sense. I'm going to walk through some of the stuff really quickly in code afterwards um, in a live coding session. But uh, I'm going to go through this kind of fast because I'm I'm assuming that everyone here has like kind of a basic grasp on like building the kernel and stuff. So. Um, to start off, KUnit has two parts. Uh, I know that sometimes confuses people who are new to KUnit. There's the internal um, testing library. Uh, they're basically the code that lives inside the kernel, which you actually use to write the tests. And then there's also this uh, wrapper tool called KUnit tool, which is written in Python, which basically just helps you build and run and get results. Uh, these two things can be used independently from each other. I do know there's people out there who don't like KUnit tool. And so they just uh, write their tests, and then they build and run their kernels manually. Um, but there are some people who like the convenience of KUnit tool. So just keep in mind that you're not bound to using KUnit tool. Uh, you can still use the other KUnit facilities. Um, just, just keep that in mind. That's sometimes somewhat confusing, I think. So if uh, you want to run KUnit tests and you don't really know where to start, a good place to uh, figure out uh, to run some tests without having to do anything. If you have a freshly cloned uh, Linux kernel tree, uh, you just type in this command tools testing KUnit, KUnit.py run, and uh, you will build and run tests and get something that looks roughly like this. Um, I think this mostly speaks for itself. Pass uh, basically says, uh, this particular test passed in as part of this test suite. Um, the actual, so these are the results you get back from KUnit tool, but if you were to run your test without KUnit tool, or if you were to examine the ND message log, you would see this somewhere in it, which is actually how uh, KUnit gets its results out of the kernel in this semi-structured, semi-human human readable format. Uh, we call it KTAP. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of KTAP, but KTAP is the standard um, test reporting uh, results, I guess, uh, standard um, for the for the Linux kernel. So um, uh, the next thing I probably want to mention is how to configure KUnit. Uh, KUnit, just being part of the kernel, is configured like any other part of the kernel with kconfig. Um, so here's an example of it. If we call it a KUnit config, but really all it is is a min config um, where we ran 
I forget the command off the top of my head, but basically it's a min, min config where if you pass this into, uh, uh, I forget one of the, which, which make function it is, but it'll generate a full valid config for you. Um, I usually just use knit tool to do this. So uh, knit tool will take a dot knit config, this min config and turn it into a full config um, for you. Um, so it's just basically a really convenient way for you to just talk about the configs that you care about, care about for your test, make it a little bit more portable for you. Um, but also, if you don't want to use knit tool, uh, like I said, you can also just use make to generate a full config for you uh, for it from this, or you could just copy them into a dot config that you already have. Um, yeah, already covered that. All right, so now I'm going to attempt to do a live coding session. Oh, oh yeah, I mentioned, uh, sorry, before I get to that, uh, does anyone have any questions so far? I think I might've gone through that a little fast. Let me check the, okay, there are, no, doesn't look like there's any questions. Okay, so um, I'll start the live coding session. Hopefully this works well. Um, <clears throat> All right, so you decide you want to, to write a test. And for, for the purposes of this example, I wanted to start off with something that everyone's somewhat familiar with. I realized that when it comes to the Linux kernel, it does so many different things. That's kind of hard to do, uh, to come up with something that you can assume everyone's familiar with. So we picked something that's pretty easy that hopefully everyone's familiar with. Uh, math functions in particular, we're going to be trying to test the greatest common denominator function. Uh, I assume that everyone here knows what uh, greatest common denominator is. If not, um, I think it's it's a simple enough concept that in between while I'm talking, uh, you could probably just go over to Wikipedia and um, look at it, you know, look it up really quickly. Um, but there's also a greatest common denominator function in the Linux kernel, and it just takes two inputs and then returns the greatest common denominator between those two things. So. Let's say you want to test this function. How would you go about doing that from the very start? Um, typically, even I, and I, I think David and Daniel probably do this as well. Um, uh, I, I like to try to find if there's a uh, test that is really similar to the th uh, test I'm going to be writing. I can, so that way I can just try to copy that. Um, if there isn't really anything similar, then um, it, you can still just go over to there's a inside of lib slash kunit. There's this kunit example test. Um, and this contains some of the boilerplate that you can then use to build a test from. So I'm going to copy that over. And now we need to start. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and delete all these comments so that way it's easier to see what's going on. Um, I'm going to walk through what each uh, what I'm doing for each part. Um, okay, so uh, I'll the comments first. Okay. Okay. So um, the most basic part, uh, like the, the fundamental building block, the most important part of writing a Kana test are the test cases. So here I'm going to call my test case GCD test. Um, I'm going to write some other test cases, but for now I'm just going to call this one GCD test. Oh yeah, and I also need the header file for GCD. But anyway, so I guess that's the first thing is this is just normal kernel code. You're calling kernel code from other things, so it behaves just like this, the way you would expect any other kernel code to behave. So I'm going to I'm using this cheat sheet. I'm going to copy over this uh, header file. And now I'm going to try to, so I'm going to, uh, I find the best way if you're building up a t it's, uh, writing, building up to write a test, uh, start off with just a single test case that is really like basically as simple as possible and is effectively just like a sanity test. So if you try to think off the top of your head, what's, what's like the simplest base case for GCD, um, at least the thing that comes to my head is doing the GCD of zero and one. For math function, putting in zero and one is usually kind of one of the first things you start off with. So um, let's do that. Put in GCD zero one. 
Oops. And of course, the GCD for anyone who doesn't know, the GCD of zero and one is one. Okay, so this is going to be our initial um, test case. Um, we're going to do some other ones, but first, let's get this test case set up. So uh, Knit has these things called init functions. I'm not going to talk about them so, too much, but basically, um, they're supposed to be helpful. Um, the idea is uh, you're, you have test cases grouped together in switch, which I'm going to mention that a little bit, but um, they can share initialization functions, which will set up state that can be used by each uh, test case. But in this case, GCD is really simple, so we're not going to use that here. So I'm just going to delete that here. OK, um, so then uh, the next bit of code here, this is basically where you register all of your test cases. So um, for now, it, the, the details of what's going on here aren't super important. Just keep in mind that all the test cases that you write, you need to put them in this array here. Um, and then you wrap the function name uh, in a K unit case. And I'm just, so that way I don't mess up and waste at any time. I'm just going to copy that over from here. Uh, but basically you just name the struct something. It doesn't really matter what it is. And then you just copy over the function name, uh, of your test case from here. Uh, and a test case, uh, the only thing that you have to do with a test case is it just has to have a return type of void and then take this context object, object uh, pointer to a struct K unit. Um, lastly, once you've put all of your, uh, uh, test cases in this object. Uh, you then need to create a suite. Uh, a suite is just a group of related test cases. And it has a name. Uh, as I mentioned before, it can have an init function, but we're not going to use that here. It can also have a, an exit function, which is just the opposite of a init function. It runs at the end of every test case. Um, and then you put the test cases here. Um, it's basically a test suite is it's literally just a collection of related test cases. Um, and then finally you register your test suite with, um, the core K unit, which will then run them using this macro here. All right. So that's, that should get us going. Um, now, uh, obviously, just like any other kernel code, you have to add it to a make file. So um, not really anything to talk about here. I, I hope everyone here already knows what make files are and how that works. So I'm not going to talk about mention that any further. Um, but similarly, since we're configuring it uh, as a test that needs to be configured to build in, build in we need to um, add a config here. Um, not too much to mention here. Um, only a couple of points. One is that if you can try to make your test try state, um, I, I know that I like to, for the most part, build my tests, uh, run my tests as built in. Um, if you build your tests into the Linux kernel, they'll all just run, uh, right before the user space is brought up. Um, however, if for some reason that doesn't work for you, um, or, you some people just like running their tests as modules um, that can be loaded later. Uh, you can also configure them as a module, and then the test runs just as soon as the module is loaded. For most tests, it won't make a difference whether you run it at startup or whether it's run as a module later. So to be convenient to other users, just try to make it try state if you can't. Um, obviously, if it needs to run before user space is set up, or it needs to run after user space is set up, then you can make it module only or built in only. But um, generally, if you can try to make it tri state. Uh, the most interesting thing here is this default K unit all tests. Um, this is something that was added fairly recently, um, I think, second half of last year. Um, basically, it um, if all the dependencies are met for a test, so uh, um, you can somebody can specify this can at all tests, and then for any test which can you know just be they don't need any uh, dependencies configured, they can just be turned on. Uh, they they'll all be enabled. Um, there are some CI systems uh, upstream which use uh, which use this, so it's 
pretty handy if you add this in because um, some of those CI systems will just automatically pick up your tests. Um, and uh, also it's convenient for people who are doing things like um, building and maintaining distros because if they want to run all of their tests on a uh, that are associated with a dot config they have, they can just turn on key at all tests and they'll be able to run all the tests that they care about. So try to do that. Um, and I think everything else here is pretty pretty straightforward. Okay, so hopefully if we did all that right, uh, I should be able to run to build and run this test now. So um, I find the easiest way to get a setup um, build environment for running KUnit is just to use um, the KUnit tool. Um, here I have these additional flags, timer or timeout equals 300. That's basically just uh, if you, it, it'll, it, it gives your test a certain amount of time to run. Uh, I've not seen this timeout in over a year, <laughs> but uh, I guess it's possible you could be working on a new test and there could be a, you know, an infinite loop in it or something. So I still add it in because it can be helpful. Um, so this is going to build a, uh, .k unit directory, which is it's just a build directory. Um, and by default, um, uh, it's going to build it as a UML kernel. Uh, to be clear, k unit is uh, architecture agnostic. You can build k unit um, for other architectures, uh, any architecture. I, at one point last summer, I went through every single architecture and every architecture I was able to find uh, 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 that I was able to build, I was able to find a tool chain to build it. I was able to get KUnit to run on it. So to be clear, I'm just using UML here because it's fast and convenient, but you can use KUnit with any architecture. Um, so um, this is just setting up a build directory, um, building a UML kernel and it's building it right now. And then it's gonna run it and spit out the results. And then I'm going to be able to go into this .kunit directory, this build directory, and then I can go and edit the configs that it drops there. Just a convenient way to get started. So um, it's going to take a couple seconds more. I can take a couple of questions now while we're waiting. Is there any questions? Doesn't look like it. So OK. Oh, wait. Yeah, OK, let's just. All right, cool. All right, so we can see um, there are some tests that are configured by default that pass. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit the uh, doc config and the candidate config. So um, first off, it, it added a couple of config entries to my candidate config that it thought were useful. Um, I don't care about that one, so I'm going to drop it. Um, and OK, we can see that our um, the new config we added is here. Um, so I'm just going to add that to this config here. Um, you don't, actually don't have to add it to the Knit config. You could just um, turn this on from here, and that would work. Um, but this way, if you, you know, you get into a bad state, you can just delete the dot Knit config or the, sorry, the dot config and it can be regenerated from the Knit config. So, uh, also if you then want to save this dot Knit config somewhere as a min config, you can use for configuring your tests. That's also handy. So, um, useful to add it here, but not strictly necessary. You just need to turn it on somewhere. Um, Another thing to note about this, uh, I've seen this trip some people up in the past, um, uh, is that if you delete something from your .knit config uh, and you're using it to rebuild uh, a .config, if it's still present there, as I think is kind of implied by your previous statement, it'll uh, it'll get built. Um, it'll it'll still uh, build that config. Um, .knit tool only verifies that the configs that you put in it are in the dot config. It does not care about uh, configs that are not specified. 
Um, and obviously, if there's conflict or if there's conflicting ones, or um, it for some reason can't turn the config on, it'll just complain at you and refuse to do anything. So it can be handy. Some people find it annoying, but I, I, I generally find it helpful. Um, so I'm going to rebuild it now that we turned our test on. We can see it's regenerating the .config um, here as opposed to generating one. So that means that it uh, is not creating a new .config from scratch. Um, so we can see our test pass. There is a, a warning here, um, which I, I did want to mention. Um, so most of our um, expectations, the, the expectations that Knet uses, uh, most of them only work on primitive types. Um, but they, and, and when they're performing comparisons on primitive types, uh, obviously, if you perform comparisons on primitive types, which are not the same uh, primitive type, some unexpected behavior can happen sometimes. So to address that, there is this um, uh, macro that it's not, we didn't write this macro, but anyway, there's a macro in the Linux kernel for things like that, which you can use to type check, or it, it's, it'll make sure that two types are of the same type. Um, and we use that, um, the warning is a little bit verbose and it's not, you know, if you look at the top line and the bottom line, it's not super clear which one it's talking about. But anyway, if you see this, just look for the type check warning. And um, it's just warning you that the two types that are being used here uh, don't match. And the reason in this case is because this is a literal. So by default, it's just being treated as a signed integer, whereas GCD has the return type of uh, unsigned long. So we can fix this warning just by adding uh, a UL here. If you rerun it, um, the warning should go away. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that because there are some people who got confused and annoyed by that in the past. But try to try to fix your warnings before you submit them. But obviously, the test will still run. Um, cool. So now we have a working test. Uh, now we can add some uh, test cases. Um, I think I'm at the 15 minute mark. Um, so now we can add some test cases, uh, some more interesting test cases. So a good principle to follow um, when you're trying to add, I think somebody's unmuted. Does somebody want to ask a question or otherwise can you mute? Um, okay. So um, uh, a good principle to follow when you're adding new test cases is uh, to try to test all the various ed edge cases and the various conditions that are interesting for your test case. So you can imagine for a math function, uh, zero and one are obviously interesting inputs typically to a um, uh, to a math function. Um, testing negative inputs might be interesting, but in this case, uh, since it only takes on side integers, that wouldn't. I mean. They'll probably get converted to signed in or to unsigned. So um, maybe not super interesting to test here. Um, there are other other things we might be interested in. Uh, so we don't actually have a case right now that tests where it actually finds a common denominator between two numbers which are composite uh, or which are going to share a greatest common denominator greater than one. So we might that might be a good place to start. So if we add one here, um, it's really easy to just copy existing test cases. And we can call this one composite or something. Um, and let's see if we take the number, the inputs 2 and 4, uh, the GCD should be 2. So we can try that. You're going to need to add, register that down below now. Okay. Um, another thing might be interesting is testing two numbers which are uh, co-prime, so they don't share any. Uh, the, the greatest common denominator they share would be one. So um, we can just test if two numbers are um, just pick two numbers which are prime. Um, uh, 
Um, why am I? I should have just copied this. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, sorry. Anyway, um, so I uh, would just pick the numbers like three and five or something. Okay. All right, so let's run these and see if they work. Cool, they do. So um, I think you could probably see this is going to start getting repetitive if I start testing all of the, if I uh, copy, uh, if I make a new test case for each and every uh, set of parameters I want to add in. So this kind of gets to the next point of um, wh when should you create a new test case and when should you um, maybe test multiple different things inside of a single test case. Um, the, 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 best, the best advice I, I can give here is um, treat your test cases as normal functions. Um, uh, just like normal functions, your functions should be easy to read. And that's really the most important thing to follow. Make your test cases as easy to read as possible. Um, and it really, especially on test cases, you should err on the side of making it even more readable than regular code. Um, and all, all of your code should obviously be written to a re reasonably high quality. Um, but because tests don't aren't concerned with things about like performance and such, really do everything in your power to make them as readable as possible. So if you find yourself writing a test case where you're doing a million different checks in it and your test case is several hundred lines long, it's probably not a very good test case. Um, you should consider maybe uh, splitting up the different checks if you find that you're each, you know, there's groupings of checks that are testing for similar related properties. Um, uh, another thing is it's okay to use helper functions. If you find that you're doing similar setup in different functions or in different test cases, maybe pull some of that logic out into a helper function. Um, obviously, in some cases, you can just use a, an init function, which will set up all the state for you. Um, so yeah, just for, the, for the, the best thing to do is just try to make them as readable as possible. And in this case, um, because these checks are so simple, I think it's probably okay with, that we can um, combine some of these checks in a single test case. So um, what we can do here is we can put the parameters um, that we're putting into the test function uh, or that we're putting into the function we're verifying um, into a... Uh, struct into an array of structs which will group the parameters together and then we can iterate through that struct and run that check multiple times within the same function so if we have time um i might at a time during the q a i might show off parameterized tests um but i'm i'm not going to talk about that right now instead i'm just going to show how you can um do multiple checks you know doing the this within a single function because it, it can it still kind of generalizes to other useful things where uh parameterized testing might not work super well so i'm going to drop these other test cases and i'm going to add in um some test parameters and again i'm just going to go to my cheat sheet um, because I don't want to get the test definition, the test definition wrong, since we're kind of running low on time now. Um, so copy this over. Okay. And Brendan, there are a couple of questions in the question oh. and answer box. box when you okay. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, I see Q and A. Uh, Let me know if you can't see it, and then I'll read them out. Yep, I can see them. Uh, you can test zero and zero. Oh, yeah, that that's a that's a good advice. Um, I'll I'll add that in when we're doing this now. Uh, closing uh, the closing brackets at the end of the uh, test is that that a canary to mark their rand. Um, no, and so in this case, uh, uh. 
uh, yeah. Um, you, you do need to add that in at the end um, because since this is added in here, um, this is there's there it may not have access to this compilation unit. And I mean, the way that this check is done is yeah, it searches for a null entry at the end. So yeah, you'll get a compile error if you don't add this in here. So yeah, that was a good question. Um, yeah, uh, did, I, did I answer? Oh, yeah, okay, it looks like I answered that person's question. Cool. So Brent, Brent and I have a question a little bit at a yeah. higher level. So if somebody, a device driver writer or developer is trying to decide um, to go with a user space test or use KUnit, hmm. are there any tips on how you would, one would decide which way to go? Yeah, um, so I, I think that um, the, the first question you should ask yourself is, are you adding a user visible feature? Like, are, are you, are you adding a syscall? Are you adding a new, um, uh, you know, something like a device file, some kind of, uh, I don't say virtual file cause that then comes as regular files as well. But, uh, are, are you adding some new way for the user to interact with the kernel? Uh, if that's the case, I think you absolutely should write uh, a user space test. Um, I mean, as, as, especially for syscalls, I think that's actually required now, right? I don't, right. I don't know. I'm, yeah, yeah. So in that case, you should absolutely, you know, you're, you're required to. Someone's going to yell at you and tell you you need to do that if you don't. Um, so uh, in those cases, you might still want to write internal uh, in kernel in kernel tests. Um, and I think a good way to look at the, to, to decide whether or not that's appropriate, um, is to, uh, just look at your code coverage. Um, if you have a lot of code, it's not realistic to think that you're going to hit all of the interesting code paths from a user space. Just like what I mentioned earlier about the, you have this combinatorial explosion when your stack traces get. Your, your fun, yeah, your stack traces get deeper and deeper. You're not realistically going to create every single possible interesting combination of input. Um, you're going to get a lot better coverage if you test some of the code internally, or rather, it's easier to get better coverage if you if you write some of those tests uh, as in kernel tests where you can call um, in kernel APIs directly. Um, now, in, in which cases would I only write an in-kernel test? Um, I think if you're only writing a, an API that is going to be consumed by other in-kernel users, I, I, I think it's in that case, it's kind of obvious that writing in-kernel only tests is probably the most appropriate thing to do. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, though, Shua. Is there Anything, I think you might have some thoughts on this. Um, also, uh, David and Daniel, do you, you have any comments you'd like to add to that? I was about to type the thing uh, in the chat, but I'll come on and say that we have seen um, there is some benefit to using KUnit for device driver testing in particular. We've seen that we've looked at the coverage we get from user space testing. Unfortunately, all these tests haven't been upstream, so I can't point you to them, but they will often lack basically any coverage of any air condition, like, you know, if we fail to do uh, do this read, or we fail to um, you know, unregister this module and stuff like that, or some drivers that never gets code coverage with user space testing because it's a bit too hard to reliably force that uh, error condition. Whereas you could, if you wanted to refactor the, the code and use it with KUnit and like pass and directly say like you know the most simplest thing you can say like a boolean like pretend that this failed or something like that, or you can do something more advanced which Brendan would probably go into later about interaction, where you could trick the code into actually the error code and make sure that it cleans up things properly and stuff like that. That's been, I think, the primary uh, motivator for people trying to use KNIT for device drivers is that they can't get that last bit of coverage to verify that they handle errors properly. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, David? Yeah, one thing I would... Uh would add is a good sort of rule of thumb is you don't want to have to like write a new um, uh, kernel module or something to expose things to user space just for testing. 
uh, yeah. if you could just write your test in kernel. Um, so it's a lot nicer uh, if you're testing things that are in kernel to have your test be in kernel um, rather than have some kernel module that exposes some internal implementation detail to a, a debug FS file or something that you then um, peek at from user space to test. Um, so that's, that's one good rule of thumb. Um, the other thing is just think about the level of the thing you're testing. If you're trying to test what a function does in the kernel, then KUnit and an, a sort of internal kernel test is probably the right level to be doing that. Um, you know, you can, you can easily test things that are, are just not visible from the user space. Uh, if you're trying to test a user space interface, then having your test in, in user space makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's also really good advice. Shu, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, this is complete. And yeah, one comment to make is uh, lock depth. So for example, if you have a locking routines which are internal to kernel, that would make perfect sense to say, hey, let's list kernel list uh, type uh, things that you would want to do kernel only tests. But if we have a syscall uh, type thing that exposes, it's a good idea to write a user space so we can um, look for regressions definitely right. that's helpful thank you and i think maybe yep. we can add a document on what document on all of all of our thoughts to the kernel i mean you know testing to say when to use what so yeah something to think about for us to guide yeah, people on yeah absolutely I, th I think that's that's actually uh something i think we might have talked about that before but yeah that's that's uh that's something we absolutely should do Yep. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Good. Great question. Um, so um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and finish up uh, this example here. I'm, I'm mostly through it. Um, I'm going to go go ahead and go over and because we've already taken some some Q and A questions, so I'm going to go ahead and finish this example up. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay. So. I added in these, these test cases uh, here. So um, yeah, in this case, obviously, we just need to loop over this. So um, I'm going to save everyone the effort and uh, just copy this from here. Uh, go. Um, and uh, I, I think probably everyone at this point is probably con, uh, convinced that this will probably run, so I, I won't waste anyone's time with it. But um, yeah, there are some. I, I wanted to go over some other uh, potentially interesting inputs. Um, I think somebody mentioned a really a really good e example of one, so I wanted to call it out here. Um, adding one in where there's zero zero. Um, I actually don't know what that what'll happen if we put in zero zero. I'm pretty sure it should be one. I'm pretty sure that's mathematically what should happen, but I've not actually tried that one. So um, that one might be kind of interesting. Um, and uh, some other things you might want to consider, like okay, so two and four, like two is actually a multiple of four, so it might be good to try to add some inputs in which are not just uh, multiples of the other number. Um, I don't know. It, it's going to kind of vary on your function. And I think this kind of gets at like a deeper point of actually, in this case, I didn't, I didn't actually open up at any point and look at what the GCD function looks like. I'm just kind of blind testing it. But um, you should actually open up your code and actually make sure that uh, you're covering all the conditions that your function um, will, um, uh, the, your, that your function has. Um, I'm not going to do it here because it takes a little while to set up, and I, maybe I should have prepared it before this presentation. But a really, oh, uh oh, huh. Okay, well, actually, this kind of this kind of gets at another interesting point. So I'm pretty sure that was that first test case that fails. Um, 
but uh, looking at the zero message, it's not actually super apparent that, that um, that's the case because uh, we can only look at the results here. And obviously there's, diff there's multiple things that have uh, a result of one. So um, one thing you should, th this kind of motivates uh, my next point of, you should try to make uh, your, uh, n not just the test cases themselves readable, but when the test case fails, you should make the output readable. Um, in this case, I think you probably saw below, uh, can it expect equal um, prints out what was passed into it, but it, it's not able to like evaluate this argument and then this argument, but not evaluate the entire thing. Like that's just not really feasible to do. So in, th in instances like this, it's, it can be handy to use the knunit expect message variant. Um, which I actually have that here. Um, this can unit expect message variant, uh, all it is is it just takes um, additional parameters at the end, uh, one required parameter, which is a just a printf style format string, and then whatever arguments that format string takes. So if we copy that over, oh, and I also need the format string. Run it, and we should get a little bit more interesting of an error now, or I guess a more helpful error message. Okay, so yeah, we see that that failed on the GC the input of GCD zero zero. Um, so that's actually interesting. I I suspected I, I th this was really actually not staged in any way. Um, I expected uh, the GCD of zero and zero to be one because I I don't think that zero is a I mean, in, in most instances, in like the integer math we're doing, I don't think zero zero or, uh, zero is a a valid denominator for anything. But evidently, the way that the GCD function is written, it actually uh, apparently is. So um, that was that was a good suggestion. Um, yeah. So I'm not gonna go into this any any deeper. I think we've covered a lot of useful territory. Um, I can extend this example better to show uh, parameterized testing if people are interested in that. Um, but I think people probably get kind of the gist of what you should be looking for when you're put, thinking of test cases to try. Um, so let's see. Um, I, I did want to go over really quickly what we what we discussed because I know that was a little somewhat freeform. Um, I just want to very quickly review uh, the points I tried to make, or hopefully made. Um, so first off, when you're trying to write your first test or you're trying to write a test and get it established, look for a test to copy. Uh, places you might be able to look for these, obviously look in the directory that you're working in. There might be a, a similar test there. Also look in menu config. That can help you discover some relevant tests. Uh, if all else fails, you can copy boilerplate out of Knit example test. Um, uh, get the test suite working. Very first thing you want to do is get a very, very simple uh, test case, like as basic as possible, that you know runs the code that you're interested in working. Um, I usually find that writing your very first test case, uh, I, I don't mean very first test case, period. I mean, Every time you're writing a new test suite, the first test case is usually the hardest because that's the one where you're building up all the necessary context in order to uh, get your the thing that you're interested in testing working. Um, so just start with a really simple sanity check. Once you get that running, adding additional test cases is usually more or less to some extent copying that first test case and then making it do more interesting things. So, but um, we have a couple of oh, questions yeah. if you want to. Feel. Okay. All right. Uh, there we go. Any comments about coverage or me measurement for a new test? So, I have a slide at the end where I'm going to sort of touch on this, but um, 
I don't believe in trying to achieve specific um, coverage numbers. Um, I have heard as a rule of thumb that coverage of 70% or more, it does not mean you have good coverage, but uh, having coverage below, certainly below 50% is usually a bad sign. That probably means you need more coverage. Probably below 70, it's something you'd want to consider. Above 70, you can actually have really high coverage, like 80% coverage, and not and still not have coverage on the appropriate places. And there are there is sometimes code where trying to get coverage for it is not helpful. Like in some cases, you have code which is generated in instances um, where you should not ever be trying to test generated code. Um, it should be the responsibility of the library maintainers who write the code that generates the code to test that code. So basically, the, the short of the answer is there is no correct coverage number. Um, looking at coverage is helpful. Um, looking at coverage, coverage can be a very, very helpful tool, but I don't I wouldn't focus on the numbers. The most valuable part of coverage that I've seen, and this is actually what's in, in the slide I have, is um, coverage, uh, things like GCOV, they can generate coverage reports where you can actually look at directories and see the coverage number for that directory. And you can actually dive down into a particular file and it'll actually show you what lines in a function were executed. And that can be really super useful to try to decide whether you actually covered all of the interesting paths. And getting back to what uh, Daniel mentioned before, making sure you covered those error paths. Because there's a lot of times there's really common error paths, but they're hard to hit over the course of normal testing. Because if you, you know, if you don't control the code on the other side, um, then it might be hard to make that error condition come up, come up um, at, at when you want it to. Um, so yeah, coverage is useful. Coverage tools are extremely useful, but I would focus on looking and making sure you've covered the interesting test cases. The coverage numbers are, they can be helpful-ish, but don't get to, you know, oh, I have a high coverage number, it's good. Oh, I have a low coverage number, it's bad. It's more complicated than that. Um, okay, next question. Does KUnit run tests associated with LKM? Currently, I do tests, do the tests and run the module as a driver and check on UML execution. But if I could use run as an LKM, it would. Uh, I take it LKM. Uh, is, sorry, is that Linux kernel modules? Um, sorry, Marcus, if you wouldn't mind posting the chat. Do you mean Linux kernel modules? Um, or do you mean something else? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait until um, Marcus clarifies that. Um, but, um, oh, yeah, there, uh, there Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Linux, kernel, Linux kernel module. OK, Linux kernel modules. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier in my talk, but I, I did kind of just briefly gloss over it. Um, KUnit can run as a module. Um, so uh, all you have to do is you um, uh, you can just uh, in your config file specify that you'd like your test to build as a module, um, and then you can uh, load it um, when you have everything set up the way you would like it, and it'll just run the test as soon as the module is loaded. Um, if your test then if you then put it in a position where it depends on running as a module, you do want to in the config file. Uh, make it module only, which is something you should generally try to avoid if possible. But if if your use case demands it, then yeah, you can make it a module only test, um, and then you can set up, you get your environment set up, and then you can load the KUnit module um, once your everything's set up, and it'll run as soon as the module is loaded. Yep. So um, one thing I'd add. Sorry, Brennan. One, one no, thing I'd add quickly to that is that the KUnit tooling does, you know, so the, the KUnit tool Python script there will not load modules for you uh, to run uh, yeah. KUnit tests. You have to use, you know, 
um, make menu config or whatever to, to enable your uh, test as a module. Um, and then what you can do is use kunit tool, uh, kunit, um, you can run kunit.py parse to parse the, the output that you get from manually mod probing that, uh, that module. Uh, and then you'll get the, the nice uh, tooling output from that. But uh, uh, yeah, if you run, run um, load a kernel module with kunit tests in it, the tests will run. The output will be put to the kernel log. Uh, if you've enabled it, it'll also be put to debugfs. Um, and you can use uh, kunit.py parse to get the, the nice uh, colored uh, test output from that. Or you can just read that uh, ktap formatted uh, output uh, manually if you prefer, or put that into some uh, test system you have. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, this is something we've actually been uh, debating um, recently, and we were trying to think of different ways, like what's the easiest way to set that up? Um, so maybe this is a discussion we should move to the mailing list but yeah currently you just have to manually do that so that's that's uh that's good good information um thank you so, uh, so we're almost at the top of the hour so i can i guess this is the last question that you want to take maybe okay um all right uh so this uh last question then um so uh, I want to let Daniel address this because uh, this is kind of uh, I, this is definitely mostly within uh, Daniel's wheelhouse. Uh, sorry for putting you on the spot, Daniel. Yeah. Um, so currently, Kate does not have any support for mocking in any way. Um, we did send an RFC, and actually Marcelo, who's in the chat, helped us out with that. Um, but it has stalled because we haven't found a test case to use it. Um, we were trying to focus on basically obstructs, faking this out and adding like, you know, helpers to say, create a function where they can you say expect call with this integer value and then you return this thing. Um, so that's sort of there in the works, it's just stalled. So at the moment, there's nothing explicitly to support that. We actually would like to encourage people not to use mocks where possible. Um, and I should clarify that we're using the term mocked a bit more uh, precisely. There's technically a difference between a mock and a fake. Um, but some people use them interchangeably. But in our context, we're, uh, when we talk about boxing and key, we're referring to things that do not know how to return values on their own. Basically, you have to tell them, given this input, return this output and stuff like that. And we'd like to avoid uh, people using that where possible, but I think this is definitely useful. Um, but yeah, so support does not exist. We don't really have a timeline for it. Uh, we would like to get it in, but it's just it's been hard to find something that satisfies the everyone's use case because some people can pay the points overhead of using obstruct or I just you know function pointer from direction so we can change out what the implementation is. Some people don't. And in the original version of Knit that Brenton proposed, um, the Alpha Master branch as it's called now, we actually used link time uh, hacks basically to stub out functions. Um, but this is was potentially already complicated, and it will add more magic to your build and test system that most people probably don't want to pay. But it would avoid runtime overhead that some people have told us they want to, they want to do. So it's it's hard for us to reconcile the trade offs here. Um, so I guess the summarizing a bit now is it depends on what you want to do. You can always do stuff yourself at the moment. Um, if you can use obstructs yourself, I would recommend making a fake obstruct that has you know implementations of the methods you call. If you can't, you'd probably have to rely on using some sort of compile time direction, you know, doing if defs on that and just have like some magic, you know, config uh, value for your test. And say like, if this is defined, instead call my test function, which I'll only define in the test. And otherwise it's just doesn't, doesn't get exist, uh, doesn't get built in or compiled at all uh, under normal builds. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure answer your question. That was a bit rambling, sorry. The, the sort yeah. of thing is that I should probably write something that's uh, a bit more concise and put this somewhere, but we just haven't got around to doing that. Yeah, so I I, I think that, that that was a good answer, Daniel, but I, I just want to mention here that um, this, this was kind of one of the special topics. I was thinking if we didn't get a lot of questions, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, I could have covered very briefly. And this is one of the, this is probably the main, one of the main points that I decided it's, it's so in depth. There's so many things to cover that it should probably go into a different talk. 
there are uh, definitely things that you can still do with Kanan and its current setup. It's it's not like built any kind of built-in mocking feature, but there's a lot of different strategies that you can do to achieve your goals. Um, uh, Daniel actually wrote up this really good document uh, that we'll need to we'll need to share. Um, but uh, yeah, this is probably something we're watch out for more information from it because we'll we'll either do a follow up talk uh, here or we'll just post a video to YouTube or something like that. So sorry, I know that's not a. I, I'm sorry that your our answer can't be more complete, Thomas. But it's a it's a big topic. So um, it was unfortunately a little bit too much for here. Uh, Brandon, I got the timing wrong. You still have half hour almost. So, yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So, um, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, sorry about that, Thomas, but uh, I guess you'll have to uh, stick, uh, keep, keep posted. And I think that um, once I finish up with the review, the overview, maybe uh, that seems like a, a good topic to dive into as an overview of, um, of, alternatives that we can do. So uh, stay tuned yeah. uh, and we'll get to that. One final note there is what we don't have is, and what appears to really be impossible to develop is a single overarching mocking implementation within KUnit that serves every purpose. And what you really need to look for is what actually can't you do um, the way your code is laid out currently and it may be oh i need to have a fake you know um block device structure or um i need to refactor my driver a little bit to introduce some function pointer based interface between you know the code i'm testing and the actual hardware that i can then intercept um so in a lot of cases you know a bunch of of c macros that are that KUnit can provide is not really what you're looking for anyway. Uh, you're, you know, if there's some way you can can refactor your code or develop some, you know, fake implementation or something, that's probably going to be better than any generic mocking uh, system. Um, and what you you may need, um, and what we hope to to make easier and, and provide better guidance around and uh, uh, helpers for are those cases where what you really need is, I need to uh, find some way of intercepting calls to a particular function. Um, but most of the time you can actually do that or uh, what you're actually wanting to do much more easily by just, just implementing a function pointer based interface to something or putting an if def somewhere, um, you know, a generic mocking framework's not actually what we've discovered. Having tried to implement this uh, over and over again is what everyone actually uh, really needs. Yeah, um, well, well said, well said. Thank you, David. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and finish up the, uh, the review of the different things from, from that and then we'll um, go back to Q&A and uh, depending on what questions, how many questions we'll get, we can dive into some of those other uh, topics like the, yeah. So, um, okay, so I already covered getting your suite working. So once it comes down to writing uh, test cases, um, uh, once you have your, you know, you have your initial one, you're adding some more in, um, there's, I've heard the saying in the past, test first, test middle, test last. Oops, I should probably be presenting the slide. Um, basically, you know, test, uh, test short inputs, test long inputs, uh, test medium length inputs. Um, try to try to cover all of the, you know, interesting cases. Um, uh, try giving your function invalid input. Um, try to exercise those error paths in your functions. Um, and then kind of going back to that question that I, I forget who asked it was, but going back to one of the questions is um, code coverage is very helpful. It can help you look at your function and make sure that you covered all of the various interesting conditions in your test. 
Um, again, like you want to make sure that you cover those error conditions. Um, sometimes the easiest way to make sure you've done that is to run coverage when you're running a test and then look at the coverage report and see, did you actually execute all the error paths over the course of all of your different tests? Um, so that's the code coverage. Again, it's, I, I wouldn't focus on a particular number, but it still can be a very valuable tool. Um, and I, I think probably the most important thing to do when you're writing test cases is to make them useful su such that they, they cover uh, an interesting variety of inputs. Um, but probably the second most important thing is make your test readable. Um, the most important thing about good test cases is that it's e easy to understand what the test cases are doing um, so that way people can improve them and modify them over time. When people get an error, it should be easy for them to understand what they did wrong or what went wrong. Um, so with, uh, with that, there are no hard and fast rules, just like there's no hard and fast rules, what your best, you know, what, a uh, the best way to write a function is. Um, really super long, several hundred line test cases are really bad, just like really long, several hundred line functions are bad. Uh, you know, having a McCabe's complexity of like 50 is going to be really bad. And generally with, um, with test cases, you even want to keep your McCabe's complexity even lower. There's usually not a lot of reason to have uh, if statements and stuff in your uh, tests. So try to avoid those. Um, but also having overly repetitive test cases can be bad too, like we saw in our example. So in something like that, consider, uh, consider using parameterized testing, or if that doesn't work, like I did in the demo, you might consider, um, trying to create a for loop that loops over some different inputs and in different cases. Um, but generally speaking, just follow best put coding practices. So I guess we've already been taking uh, questions. Um, let's see if we have any new ones. Um, is there anything anyone wants to ask before we dive into, uh, I'm gonna give an overview. Like I said, Daniel wrote up this really nice doc on what to do. I'm gonna say, it, it, it's not a doc on how to do mocking per se, but it, it's a document that kind of covers like what you can do when you want to do mocking. Um, so if I, I don't see any questions, I'll just go ahead and dive into that. Uh, another topic we can cover is on managing state. And as I mentioned before, the, another thing we can also talk about is I can show how to convert the test that I, I wrote in the coding session into a parameterized test. Um, so uh, once we get done with the, um, with the, mocking stuff, uh, we can go into one of those if people are interested. Um, so um, actually, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, present the doc that uh, Daniel wrote. Uh, I already looked it over and made sure there wasn't anything that is not safe to share. Uh, yeah, uh, and Daniel, go ahead if you wanna dive in, if at any point I'm talking about things and uh, you have more that you want to add, uh, feel free. Um, so, okay. So the first thing which I know Daniel mentioned when he was giving his response is um, runtime and direction. He mentioned specifically you can use um, obstructs. Um, so a lot of times you'll have a function, like I think, I think the the person who asked the question asked in the context of hardware. I might I might be mistaken. I might be conflating that with something else. But a really common use case is uh, it has to interact with hardware in some way. So one thing you can do is you can, um, if the performance is not super, super critical, um, you can wrap all of the code that talks directly to hardware, like make those functions as simple as possible. And then you can uh, make take those functions, and then rather than call them directly, uh, 
in your the function that you're interested in testing, you can instead pass in a uh, function pointer to what would typically be the um, code that like the the hardware accessing function, and then you call the function pointer from inside the test. Like obviously, if you have multiple functions here, you'd probably put this uh, like. Daniel said inside of an obstruct, but this is just kind of to try to be bare bones, like minimal concept here. Um, so then when the code code's functioning normally, send data func uh, would be this really simple function that maybe all it calls is like some sort of like write long um, into a register or something, or something, something that's very easily visually validated. Um, and then when uh, you're testing, this would get replaced or maybe called directly by the testing function. And instead, it would pass in some kind of dummy function, some sort of fake function that either doesn't do anything, or maybe it's a mock and it just pretends to do what you expect the hardware to do in that case. And this is actually a really powerful idea. Um, you can actually. A lot of hardware behavior is actually fairly like the 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 way it it, it communicates with the driver. A lot of the 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 communication is actually like pretty simplistic, and so you can actually build up a state machine um, behind an obstruct and then simulate uh, hardware like errors coming from hardware and things like that. Um, so obstruct is one way. Um, and actually, with the class mocking thing, um, the class mocking that we implemented, there, there's a RFC out on the list. We sent it out a long time ago, and like David and Daniel mentioned, you know, we we might do something with it, we might not. Um, but uh, that's basically all the class mocking really does. It kind of just helps you in these scenarios where you there already is an obstruct. It just helps you build up that obstruct. But there's really no reason you can't just do that without KUnit or without the mocking functionality. Um, so the I, I think I kind of already covered most of these uh, pros. Um, I mean, this this is a pattern. Actually, one thing I should mention: this isn't really new. Um, this is this is a pattern that's heavily used by uh, a lot of drivers in the Linux kernel. So. You know, I, I, there might be some people who are a little concerned about performance, but there's already a lot of places where the kernel does this. There's definitely some places where you won't want to do this, but most of the time, I'm, I'm going to say like 95% of the time, it's fine. And that's the really the right way to do it. Um, so um, getting into the cons. Well, like I said, 95% of the time, that's the correct thing to do, but 5% of the time, it isn't. Um, the, um, there are instances where it, the runtime overhead of calling uh, of an indirect call is going to be too expensive, um, in which case you're going to have to do something more complicated. Um, again, this is like, it's probably not even 5% of the time. It's probably like 1% of the time. So. You know, really think hard whether your code is actually that performance critical. It probably isn't, but there will be instances where it is. Um, another thing I think is kind of clear from from this example here is that uh, there's a lot of boilerplate in doing that. Um, class mocking, if, if we were to write a library for it, might help cut down on it a little bit. But honestly, there's there's going to be a lot of boilerplate no matter what. Um, so just to jump uh, in super quickly yeah. on the performance critical note, it's also worth noting that there's a difference between something being performance critical in production and performance critical while you're running your tests. So That's while true. you might That's think really my code is really performance critical, um, in a lot of cases you can just if def out, you know, have have the indirection only exist when you're testing. Um, That's true. And in that case, uh, it's not as much of an issue. Um, 
you're not going to be benchmarking your unit tests uh, necessarily. That that's a very good point. That's that's kind of a hybrid approach between um, there's there's actually another thing that Daniel mentioned here in this doc, which is covers sort of like the other side of of that hybrid. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll point I'll point it out when I when I talk about that. But yeah, that's kind of what what David's talking about. It's a really good idea because it's kind of like the best of both worlds between trying to redirect at compile time and trying to redirect at um, runtime. So yeah, good point. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Oh, you turned your your mic off, so I'm guessing now. Um, okay, so another thing you can do. Um, so I mentioned compile time. There's also link time um, that Daniel pointed out here. Um, there, this is actually another place where not the RFC that we have out now, but in the KUnit Alpha Master, if anyone's familiar with that, which is based on the version, I think the first RFC of KUnit that I sent to the Linux kernel, uh, it made use of this. Um, and that was not super popular as, as I wrote it, but nevertheless, you can still use the strategy and employed here. Um, and this is really helpful when you have a function which um, for, some, for some reason you can't just, uh, you, you can't do um, indirection and have that function uh, called, um, you can't have that function passed in as like an obstruct or a pointer or something. What you can do is you can make it a weak symbol. Um, and for people who aren't familiar with weak symbols, weak symbols are basically symbols where uh, weak is a is a um, uh, flag. Uh, I forget what the, the term is. Basically, a flag for the compiler um, to, to tell it that it's a weak symbol. And telling the by telling the compiler that you're basically saying, okay, if you see this and this is the only symbol that you see, use this function definition. However, if you see another if this function is defined somewhere else without the weak symbol, use that one instead. So it basically provides you a way to, depending on whether the other symbol is visible or not, and that can be controlled via kconfig or just using macros or something, um, it'll control which function definition is used. So basically in the context of a test environment, like when you're running tests, you can configure the macros or can config in such a way that the normal definition, which accesses hardware, could be replaced by some kind of mock or fake definition, which doesn't to make it more test friendly. Um, and yeah, so you can see here you have your, your weak definition, which is the real definition. And then in a test file, this test file would only get built in um, if, you're building in the test and presumably in that case, you wouldn't care about the real implementation. So this would end up uh, getting linked in uh, and called in all of these call sites to the uh, instead of the original function. Um, so that's one option. Um, yeah. Um, uh, th this does carry some pretty significant um, drawbacks. In the case of the doing the uh, runtime indirection with an obstruct or pointers, um, that has the advantage that you can really con easily control the scope of, of doing that. Um, so you're basically saying, I want this function to call these fake functions instead of the other ones, but all of your all of the other code in the kernel will remain unaffected. However, because you're letting the the linker do this, and and more importantly, the linker uh, is going to replace all of these call sites and make them all point here instead of the real original definition. Obviously, this is something that wouldn't work with something like uh, kmalloc, which I, I don't know that anyone would ever try to mock out kmalloc, but Arguments like let's say say somebody tried to do that, uh, you wouldn't almost no code in the kernel, including a lot of code in KUnit, wouldn't work if you tried to do that because there's a lot of stuff like a lot of infrastructure 
like very basic infrastructure in the kernel that depends on that. So, you know, this is this basically the the big problem here is it has a really large blast radius. So it's very powerful, but it also has a lot of drawbacks to it. Um, do we have any questions? No. Okay. So um, I think the um, another thing you can do, which also has a very large um, uh, blast radius is um, uh, using ftrace. Um, I'm, I'm not, we don't really, actually, I guess the, this kind of more or less does what you're, um, gives an example, but uh, ftrace is a cool feature where you can take a live kernel and at runtime you can patch in um, function behavior. This is totally unassociated, like you can use this separately from KUnit. Um, now this is very powerful and it does have the benefit that you can sort of turn on these fakes and mocks only when you're ready to use them in a setup kernel. But again, despite the fact that in terms of, from a temporal standpoint, it has a smaller blast radius than, uh, doing the link time thing, it still is going to change every single call site in the kernel. So in that sense, and I guess from a spatial standpoint, you know, affecting the entire binary, it, it has a very significant blast radius and thus has the same potential issues as um, the link time variant. Um, and also ftrace, my, you know, my, when I've looked at ftrace, it's, it's not, I don't find it particularly uh, intuitive to use. It's, it is somewhat complicated and it's also very architecture dependent. So that's another major drawback to ftrace. Um, it's definitely not as easy as the other ones. Um, so the, the last one, which is kind of what David sort of pointed, touched on compile time and direction. Um, well, I mentioned his was kind of an, a hybrid approach between compile time and direction and runtime indirection, but what compile time indirection is, is basically you can add some uh, macros in and sprinkle them in the functions that you are, you know, causing testing issues that make it difficult to test the code, maybe because they communicate with hardware or something. And um, then the definition of these macros can change um, um, depending on whether it's configured for a test or not. Now, again, this does have the limitation, same limitations as everything except the um, uh, runtime variant in that these macros are going to get changed everywhere from, you know, from when you compile the kernel, all of the uh, associated call sites will change. Um, but it is a little bit more flexible than link time because rather than forcing you to use a particular function, which of course, in the other case, you could wrap the function that you're interested in in yet another function. So that way you can kind of limit the scope to just being the code under test. Um, here, I think it's a little bit easier to do that in some regards, and it's kind of easier to drop things in where like depending on some contextual information you can rather than just call a function you can actually have it return from the function and basically prevent it from doing a hardware access or something like that um and like david mentioned you can combine this with the um uh um runtime indirection with using something like an obstruct where the call site might be um, when it's compiled without testing, it is a, um, a fixed call that calls directly to some function, but in the case of test, uh, when it's run in a test context, then it calls the obstruct and in which case that could, it could choose which one it does. So that gives you kind of the benefit of, it has the performance of, uh, it, it has it has no performance um, penalty, but it has the benefit that it still very um, heavily limits the blast radius when you're using it, 
um, in testing because you still are able to control it with the abstract in the test environment. So that that's kind of an interesting uh, approach to doing it. Oh yeah, yeah and you're, you're oh, yeah. to the very bottom of the doc and you'll see examples of this. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. If you skip to the very bottom of the doc, like the very last section on the All last right. page, um, there's examples yeah. of what that is but more practically. But the idea you can have uh, yeah. A wrapper that you only have for the test. Um, if you scroll down more a bit, there's like yeah. an example of how you like, do case and stuff like that, and target that more uh, um, specifically to avoid changing too many things. Which is the heads up. We only have a few minutes left on the, uh, the meeting, so right. Yeah. Away from right. That's a good point. Sorry, I lost uh, track of time. So, uh, oh, we do have a question on Q and A. Um, are these examples available someplace? Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, we we should we need to send those out. So we'll we'll follow this up uh, with sending some of those examples out. So sorry about that. Um, okay, so I guess we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, probably not enough time to cover anything else in detail. Are there any questions that anyone has? Is there any comments uh, that any of the other panelists would like to make on anything that's been said so far? Um, I see some new messages. Um, okay. Yeah. Zero is apparently the correct result, by the way, for the GCD. Oh, zero is? Oh, good to know. Okay. So the function's not wrong. I, I didn't suspect it was, but uh, sorry, Shua was saying something? I was just saying thank you, and then, then David and Oh, Daniel, this is great. Thank you for having us. Yeah, great. Well, if there are no other questions, I just want to say thank you so much to Brendan for his time today, and thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today, um, and the slides will be on our website as well. Uh, we hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone.